You know, there are very few guests where I really don't have to introduce them, but I will for the one or two people who may not know who you are, Inky Johnson, Ball for Life, um, and one of the most well-known VFLs uh, to come through UT. Let's talk a little bit about your story, because I'm not going to get to why you're mostly um, you know, known now. Absolutely. But how did you get to UT? You grew up in Atlanta, right? Yes. Okay, yes. so from the A, take me yeah, to your childhood. Yeah, born and raised in the A, uh, southeast corner to be exact, neighborhood by the name of Kirkwood. And uh, just coming up like any other kid, man, dreams, goals, aspirations, uh, coming up in a two-bedroom home with 14 people. And I was attending Krim High School on the east side of Atlanta. We got a new coach, a guy by the name of Darren Miles, my senior year. And uh, nobody wanted to coach us. I'll never forget, like, people would come visit us, and I would be like, man, what about the new coach? And they'd be like, oh, he left. You know, and so when Coach Miles <laughs> were a came, lot? Were y'all a lot or something? Oh, we were terrible. Oh, okay. Like, <laughs> you know, like, we were terrible in terms of, like, you know, not only the team, but it was just a lot going on. You know what I'm saying? Like, people would go into the locker room, steal everything. Like, it was just a lot going on. And so I felt like some coaches just felt like, man, I just want to coach. Like, I don't want to be dealing with all that. <laughs> And when he came on a visit, I just thought because of the encounters prior to him, like he's not gonna stay, right? Because he was coming from a winning program across town, like a really good program. Mm -hmm. I'm like, why would he come to us? Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, he called me and he was like, hey man, like I'm looking at tape, I heard about you coming to practice. And I'm like, ah, in my head, I'm like, he probably gonna leave. I'm like, Nah, man, I'm trying to go to the NBA. You know, just a typical kid, right? Yeah. He like, oh, okay, I hear you. And he starts to talk to me and challenge me and make a long story short, he was Jamal Lewis's high school coach that played running back at Tennessee. And so he was just like, man, listen, I can guarantee you this. If you come and you give me everything you got, I'm going to give you everything I got. He was like, what college do you want to go to? I was like, I just want to go to school, man. I just want to go to college. He was like, I tell you what, you do what you got to do. I'm going to do what I got to do, and we'll see if we can get you in school. And I remember my second week of my senior year, he was sending tapes out. He had my father sending tapes out to every school. And uh, I'll never forget, Philip Foreman came into my high school. And i never forget, he joked with me. You know, he's being himself. And every other encounter I had had prior to Coach Foreman, I don't know if they really believed that I would qualify because I had academic issues. Because I was at a school to where there was no expectation in terms of the kids making it Division One to play sports. That didn't mean they didn't have the talent. It just wasn't expected mm -hmm. because of all of the other stuff. Like when we would be at the lunchroom table, people weren't talking about college. People were talking about their mom just got out of prison. People were mm -hmm. talking about something just happened with their brother. So it, that just wasn't the dialogue. And so every coach that came in, I had some issues academically. Wasn't qualified. I didn't know about the sliding scale, I didn't know about all this stuff. So I was playing catch up and every other coach would speak to me in the manner of, all right, man, we got the JUCO route or maybe you can go to Hargrave Military Academy, maybe you can go to Georgia Military Academy. And I'm a guy that's based off of belief, that's based off of faith. And I met Philip Fulmer and I'll never forget, we went back to my coach's office and all he said to me when we sat down was, I'm gonna see you in the summer, right? He said, you're going to handle your business, right? I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm going to see you in the summer, right? I said, yes, sir. And he shook my hand. And when he left, I told my coach, I was like, that's my type of guy, right? Because I knew at that point he believed in me, despite the circumstance and situation. Like, he believed in me. In spite of what I was up against, he believed in me. And so that's what got me to Knoxville, right? I had somebody that believed in me, and my whole life, I had people like that. You know, in spite of my circumstances, I always had somebody, and I felt extremely blessed that somebody would always come in my life and see something in me when I couldn't see it in myself. And I felt like Coach Foreman was just another piece to that puzzle that saw something in me when I couldn't see it in myself, and his belief fueled me to get me to Knoxville. Yeah. That's wild, because, you know, it, I think a lot of people take for granted when you, the part that really stuck when you said, in the lunchroom, we weren't talking about college. Mm. For a lot of um, young people, they don't understand that there aren't the whole, like, I wanna go to Harvard one day, or I have to go to this Ivy League, or I have to go to this particular school. Some kids are like, I just wanna go to college. If Absolutely. I can just make it to college, 
I'm gonna make it. Absolutely. I, I'm gonna make it. Just want a shot. So you get to UT, was it what you thought? Oh, it exceeded all expectations. It was phenomenal. Uh, for the first time in my life, I felt as if um, the playing field was level. You know, because coming up my whole life, I felt like I never had the resources, I never had the access. And um, when I got to UT, I was like, okay, cool. I'm in an environment now to where I can get busy, right? Yeah. Academically, I got support. You know, in the sports realm, I got support. In the community, I got support. And so I felt like even if I didn't make it to the NFL, even though those were my aspirations, I felt like I was in an environment to where I could still change my life, mm -hmm. you know, just because of the resources, the people I was being introduced to. I wasn't used to that. And so it was hard for me to take that for granted. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like you're coming into an environment and they're giving you shoes, they're giving you jogging suits, they're giving you all this stuff. Me and my cousins wore the same clothes. Right. And so for me, a jogging suit from UT was like, I got my own jogging suit. This is right? Prada. It might as oh, well be it's, Prada. I'm talking, I am, about, it's like, new. <laughs> I'm talking about, I'll never forget when I had my own bed. Like, I'm like, oh. I got my own bed up here. Like, like all of that stuff to me was a big deal, oh. you know, and certain people came from that environment, which was great. Right. You should want to come from environments like that. That's awesome. You should want to have that type of access like that's awesome. I just didn't come from that. Yeah. And so when I got here, I was being exposed to a lot of different things, and it was hard for me to take that for granted. And so when I would walk into a facility like UT's facility, it was like, man, I'm going to give everything I got to it because I felt so blessed to be in that environment because I wasn't coming from an environment to where we just had access or things like that. What, what were you like as a student? Were you uh, outgoing? What, who was inky outside of football? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what kind of student were you around campus? Silly. Uh, just laugh at the guys all the time, laid back, same way I am now, you know, I'm a guy that I'm laid back, people see me speak, but I'm, I'm laid back personality wise, I joke, um, curious, very introspective, um, but I'm just a laid back guy, man, I like to laugh a lot, I like to understand why things work the way they work, why people think the way they think. Um, like to challenge and go against the grain a lot just in terms of whether it be concepts, beliefs, things of that nature. So it could just sharpen me as a person, but I'm a laid back person. I'm sorry, this is Inky with the academic uh, problems. Yeah, you yeah. sound like a complete philosopher. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> nah, <you're good. laughs> coming, coming from your high school, you talked about your background and, and it was a rough start. Mm -hmm. Would Inky in high school ever have thought you would have been a captain of the football team at one of the powerhouse you know, football programs um, in the country? Did you ever see that for yourself, captain of the football team or a captain of your? Yeah, it, it wasn't so much of, about uh, being a captain mm -hmm. as it was about leading by example. And if that led to being a captain, okay, cool. But I wasn't, even when I played, if you ask some of the guys that I played with, I was never a front runner guy in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, just talking all the time. That wasn't me. I would say something if I felt it needed to be said, but I was more so, I wanted to lead by example every single day. So when I did say something, guys could respect my actions enough to say, all right, man, I respect what he's saying because his actions align. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was always about just lead by example, man, show up and work. Like my grandmother used to always say, sweep in front of your own front door, right? right? Sweep in front of your own front door and make sure you handle your business first. And so for me, it was always just about coming up every single day, bringing everything I got to it so my teammates can know I respect the game, I respect them, and if it leads to being a captain, cool, you know, and so for me, that was never the aspiration. It was more so about just being a good teammate. Yeah. What was that first game like, that first UT game you put on your yeah. orange and white uh, and you were on the field? Unbelievable. I did a video uh, at UT uh, some years ago, and um, I think the word that I used to describe it was bulletproof. Like you just feel bulletproof. Like I felt bulletproof when I ran through that T, that stadium. Like I didn't play in front of, of course, coming out of high school, you're not playing in front of 100,000. But I probably played in front of 100 people. Right. Right, you know what I'm <laughs> yeah. saying? So on a Friday in Atlanta, like I'm from inner city Atlanta, not the outskirts. You know how much stuff is going on in Atlanta? Like I was an Atlanta public school kid. People weren't coming to a high school football game on a Friday night just in Atlanta <laughs> if you weren't good. So nobody was coming to watch us. And so when I came out the tunnel, 
I was like, oh man, this is unbelievable. Like, I couldn't wait. You know, I couldn't wait. But also, um, I often tell people just the idea, I think, was more powerful than the person. And what I mean by that is just the idea of Inky Johnson coming from two bedroom home, 14 people, Krim High School, making it to UT. Mm -hmm. The idea of that happening was more powerful than me. Just the fact that in my community, I knew my cousins, my friends, kids back in my community was able to look at the television and see me mm -hmm. and know like, man, that dude was just here with us. Mm -hmm. Like that dude was just walking the same streets as us. Like if he can do it, I know we can do it, right? Just that idea of being able to see that. And I was always cognizant of that, you know? And so for me, running out of the tunnel was phenomenal, but it also created a level of fight in me that I didn't want to lose this experience, mm -hmm. right? Because I knew that idea was fueling people back in Atlanta where I came from to know, hey man, this is possible, right? And so absolutely. What were those conversations like calling home? You uh, got to think those first few games, they were just like mind blown. Talking trash, yeah. talking <laughs> trash, you know, talking trash, man. But it was, it was awesome. You know, my grandmother and my mom, like, I came up in a real small church, mm -hmm. like a house church in the a, in a city. And, um, you know, 150 people, you know. On a good Sunday. On, on the first Sunday. Sunday. Easter Sunday. <laughs> Easter. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and uh, we had testimony period. Ever since I was a little boy, you know, to where people would get up at the beginning of the service and just testify about something that, you know, happened that week. And um, I never forget, I came home one time and I'm in church and my grandma gets up to testify. My mom gets up to testify. And of course, it's all about ink at UT, right? And it was hilarious, but it was beautiful, you know, because it let me know how big of a deal this was, you know, because I've heard my mother testify before. I've heard my grandmother testify before. And so for them to testify about me being at the University of Tennessee, first one in my family to go to college. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a big deal. Every time I would call home or they would call me, it would be five, six people around the phone. Hey, Ink, you, you just send us a shirt. Like all that type of stuff. Man, you give me a jogging suit. Like, Ink, you gonna bring me the wristbands? You gonna bring me the gloves? Yeah. Like all of that stuff that sometimes, you know, we as people take for granted. You know, every time I went home, I would go with a duffel bag full of stuff. If guys didn't want stuff, Hey man, let me take that home. Like I grew up, I got a lot of cousins, right? And like when I would come, yeah, I would give them gloves, I would give them shirts, shorts, but I knew the representation of that was a lot deeper than apparel, mm -hmm. right? When they would wear them gloves in the street and kids would be playing and catching a ball with Inks gloves from UT, that was also a level of belief like, man, one day I'm gonna go to college, yeah. right? One day I can do it, right? And so for me, it was a big deal every time I got on that phone and I could hear those different voices. They would be asking me different things as it pertained to my experience. It was a big deal. A little touch of success. They were touching that success. Absolutely. You had started. Absolutely. You, you know, you had a, a, a beautiful career uh, at UT on the field. Mm -hmm. It all came down to one tackle. Now, I'm not a sports person. I'm not going to even sit yeah, here and pretend yeah, I am. No, I'm you not. Could. I, you if you know me, you, you know I can, we're not going to talk plays or anything. Oh, good. But. You know, watching football, you know how routine it is to get hit. Right. And you had a very, what should have been a very routine tackle mm -hmm. um, that changed everything for you. Walk us back to that game that changed the trajectory of your life. Yeah, it was September 9th, uh, 2006. We're playing against Air Force. Tough group, disciplined group, great group of guys. Fourth quarter, a little bit over two minutes left. And uh, like you just spoke to, it was just a routine tackle. I'd been in a lot harder collisions. Yeah. Um, and as soon as I hit the guy, it seemed as if every breath in my body left. I had never felt anything like that. Body goes completely limp, hit the ground, blackout, wake up, come to, and I just feel a shock going from the crown of my head to the bottom of my feet. And I didn't think it was anything serious, right? I thought like, man, maybe I got a stinger. Maybe I broke my arm. I didn't think it was anything deep. And um, when I couldn't feel my arm in my hand, I thought like, ah, maybe I broke it. Yeah. 
And I'll never forget, my right eye wouldn't stay open. That's something I remember vividly. Even as they were wheeling me off the field and people see me putting my arm up, my right eye wouldn't stay open. Like it would just, oh, it would just fall. I'll never forget it. And uh, one of the doctors mentioned something to the extent of maybe it's some nerve damage, something like that, yeah. right? I just remember my eye wouldn't stay open. And we got to the hospital. Things were like protocol. They were doing their jobs, right? They had me calm, cool. And um, I remember them saying something to the extent of got to rush him back to emergency surgery, right? And one of the guys was like, man, he's, he's ruptured his subclavian artery in his chest. He's bleeding internally. And I was like, whoa. And the next morning I woke up, six cuts down my left thigh, one cut across the left side of my neck, one across the right, twice through my right ribs, cut out my right pec. And they said I tore the nerves in my brachial plexus, which were the nerve roots that went from my spine, control shoulder, arm, hand, fingers. And um, that's when they told me basically the soft landing of, yeah, man, it's probably, it's probably over. Did I believe it at that point? No because I couldn't, um, I couldn't fathom that something I've been working for since I was seven would end like that. I just couldn't, I couldn't come to grips with it, even though now when I look back on it, I could see them kind of letting me know I just wasn't in the place to receive. Um, I just thought, all right, man, I'm gonna handle this the way I've handled everything else in my life. And bounce back. I'm going to bounce yeah. back. I'm going to fight through it, get yeah. through it, and I'm going to come back stronger. Yeah. Not only am I going to bounce back, I'm going to be better because of it. And um, partway through the process of two years in terms of my recovery with my arm, I knew, like, nah, it's over. Like, I'm, I'm done. Yeah. yeah. We see you today, and, and you're this motivational speaker. I mean, you go out there, and you you know, get people in a mindset um, to, to really push through life. Mm -hmm. But you can't tell me you were like that from the very beginning. No. That had to be a journey to get to this place. Absolutely. Yeah. I, um, if somebody would have asked me, if somebody would have put things on a table mm -hmm. and speaking would have been one of the options in terms of my future. Right. They would have said, hey, Inc., which one of these, when you're career, which one of these you think you'll end up doing? I never would have picked speaking. Like, ever. Like, ever. Like, never. That's, that was never your thing. Ever. <laughs> ever. 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 Right? And, um, like, I feel so grateful because I look at it in terms of, um, like, it's almost as if, uh, God blessed me to discover a gift that I had inside of me that I didn't know was there. I never knew. Like, I never. Like, pay thought. you to tell your story? I got it. Yeah. Like, what? Yeah. Right? The kid from Crib? Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> like, and also that people will come up to me and say, hey, man, um, I watched this with my son. Or, hey, I listened to this with my daughter. She's an athlete or hey, man, I got a daughter going through law school. I sent her that video. Like, that means so much to me because I got kids, right? I got a wife. I got three little sisters. I know how busy life is, right? I know how intense things can get. Mm -hmm. And so for somebody to actually stop with their children and say, hey, come check this out, or for someone, somebody to value what I have to say, like, that means the world to me. But what's even more important and what makes me grateful is that I feel as if God trusted me, you know, and that means a lot to me. And so for me, in terms of speaking, yeah, I never imagined I would be doing it, but also on the other end of the spectrum, I would never take it for granted because I knew for, like, I know this is being orchestrated by a power that's a lot greater than me. If you go back home, if you go to my mother, if you go to my father and say, hey, it, did he ever show signs of speaking? They're going to be like, man, dude couldn't even talk. Like, <laughs> you talking about speak? Like, no. And so I know that it's being orchestrated by power that's a lot greater than me. And so I'm grateful for it. But I never in a million years thought I would be doing what I'm doing. 
you know, we always talk about um, representation matters, um, and that comes in different forms, whether it's Absolutely. you know gender, race, all, all different forms. Do you ever stop and think about the inspiration that you give or the pride you give, um, especially to young people who have physical differences, mm -hmm. uh, whether they were born with it, born with it congenital or through an accident? Um, where where is that a place in what you do and, and how you speak to people? Absolutely, um, I'll tell you. I didn't at first. I didn't think about it because. You know how it is when you go through things, you kind of go through your train of thought in terms of what is this, mm -hmm. like how did this happen, and I always say to people, when you go through something, oftentimes you want to understand it, right? If something happened, adversity and opposition, initially you want to understand it, like, man, what is this? Why did this happen to me, right? And I tell people, just survive it, right? And when you get to a place of peace, then you go back and you can go down the hole and the engine of trying to understand what happened, how did it happen. But I was in that space and place for a while, but I was still going back and forth to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And you see everything there. You see a lot of young people with a lot of different, you know, situations, mm -hmm. intense situations. And it made me more cognizant of representation. And then once I started to get out on the circuit and speak, you know, a mom would come up to me, a guy would come up to me, a person would come up to me, a lady would come up to me. Hey man, I got a brachial plexus situation when I was born. Or hey man, this happened. Hey, you're helping me deal with this, yeah. right? And I didn't think about those things at first. And so for me, even with the way that I make humor of the situation sometimes, it was a time I couldn't do that, right? When my injury first happened, you know, and I would go out and people would look at my arm or my hand. It was more so like, man, like, why don't they say something, mm. right? Why don't they just ask a question, right? That was my train of thought. Mm -hmm. And so it went from that to, I started asking a question. When I would see somebody looking, hey man, you wanna know what happened? Oh, and wow. And they'd be like, oh. And I was like, oh, it's all good, man. It's all good, what happened? Man, football injury, and we'll just go down the rabbit hole, right? And so for me, that put me in a place of peace to where I wasn't giving my circumstance or my situation power, mm -hmm. right? It was more so about using it as a tool to just add value to the world. And so for me, the representation now is just being cognizant of what this represents. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You met your wife. Now, did y'all go to UT together? Is that no, no, no. She went to Alabama a and We grew up oh, together. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, she went to Alabama okay. a and Yeah. She used to be up here, though. The, yeah, yeah. How has she supported you through this? Mm -hmm. Because I can't imagine it, being married is already a journey. Right, right, right. But then you add in those, you know, extenuating circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what has what role has she played in your life? I, I'm so grateful for my wife. We grew up together, uh, two blocks away from each other. Been knowing my wife since elementary school, fifth grade, and um, you know, it's like she knows me always tell people she knows me like she knows when my energy is off she knows when i'm doing great she knows when i'm conscious like she knows me mm -hmm. so much so to the point to where her supporting me i kind of look at it like me going throughout life with my best teammate you know how when you play sports or you just do things life business whatever it is and you got somebody that you're doing it with that knows you right that can see things when you don't see them mm -hmm. right that knows hey check this out hey, you might need to do this. And that's how I feel every single day going throughout life with my wife, right? Because we first met in the fifth grade and we were locked in ever since. And so for me, every single day, I feel extremely grateful that I'm with somebody that knows me. Yeah. Like prior to speaking, prior to not the ball. football player. That's thank you, ball like for life. You know, me when I was a little dirty, little joker, <laughs> running around, little nappy head, scratches <laughs> on my face, trying to get cocoa butter from my grandma. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like she knows me, and uh, we've been blessed, man, with two kids, uh, Jada and Ink, and I'm grateful to do life with her. I am I'm grateful. Ha ha has your life story like changed the way like you father? Mm -hmm. Do you think it? Do you think you would have been a different father, type of father, had that entry not happened? I think so. Yeah, I, I like to think so. Um, I feel like my injury 
it created more compassion, mm -hmm. uh, more empathy. It showed me how fragile life is. Um, it showed me how quickly things can change. Um, it changed a lot of my principles, concepts, morals, just in terms of my children, how we do things, how we approach things. Mm -hmm. um, if I didn't get injured, I don't know if my thought process would have been that because I probably could have looked at it with the thought process of, and we've both met these type of people in terms of the thought process. If I did it, why can't you do it? Oh, that's right. Right? I came from that. Why can't you do it? Right? When everybody has different circumstances, different situations, different encounters. And if I probably would have made it from this two-bedroom home, 14 people, 16-year-old mother, Kirkwood, this environment, this school, and just went straight NFL, career, then come back and talk to some of these people, and when they would say something to me, I just, man, I did it. Why can't you do it? Right? Mm -hmm. And then when life changes, get an injury, you go down this different road, solitude, thought process, perspective, meeting people, it changes you. And so for me as a father, I felt like this, this made me better. This made me a better father. It changed my perspective. And just in terms of how we approach and do life with our children. And so I'm grateful for it, yeah. Do you ever get tired of talking about it? And I feel mm. like that's a fair question because it yeah. doesn't define who you are. Absolutely. It is a part of your story. Right. But do you ever get to like, just, man, I just want to have a regular day. <laughs> nah, nah, like, nah, nah, nah. Go to Kroger, come back <laughs> nah, home. Nah, you know what oh, I mean? Nah, 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 nah. It's all good. I get it, though. <laughs> no, I get it. But I, I don't because it's just a part of who I am. Now, if you would have caught me three years outside of the injury, I probably would have felt like, yeah, man. Like, I'm tired of it, yeah, mm -hmm. every day, right? But now I've accepted it as this is just who I am. This is my life. This is my new normal. It is what it is. It's a tool. I can use it. Like, it's just a gift. Mm -hmm. And early on, I didn't look at it that way, right? Early on, I was more so just trying to figure it out while trying to get through it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't always see the impact that it was having on those I was connected to. And so now when I go out my door in the morning, I feel like I'm walking out with a tool, an instrument that I can impact the world with. Yeah. You know, as we wrap, what, what would you want to be your UT legacy? This is Voices mm -hmm. of the Valley, and of course UT is a part of that, the yeah, voice right yeah. here in the Valley. Absolutely. So what, what would you, how would you like to be forever remembered? Um, as a guy that did it the right way. In spite of adversity, opposition, challenges, um, a guy that showed up and did it the right way. He represented his family the right way. He represented the institution the right way. He represented the people that believed in him and saw something in him when he couldn't see it in himself in the right way. A guy that did it the right way. Yeah. I like that. Absolutely. Thank you, Johnson. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You are wonderful. Thank, Thank you for you. telling your story. Thank you.